Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Medill's High School Journalism Live workshop. This is the wor first workshop in our program and we're very excited to see all of you. We have folks joining us from all over the world today and there'll be uh, up to 100 people here with us. And that we think it's really exciting that we're able to reach so many of you wherever you may be right now. Uh, during our program, we ask that you remain on mute and enter any questions you might ha have for Jay Adande in the chat room. And we'll hope to get to all those questions towards the end of our program. Also at the end of the program, we'll be randomly pulling one of your names to win a piece of awesome Medill merchandise, branded merchandise. Uh, you must be present to win, so don't leave our, our discussion until we've done our drawing. Uh, a new item will be awarded at each of our high school journalism workshops this fall. So if you can, we hope you'll register for future ones and join us then as well. This program will be recorded and we have your names and we'll, re we'll send an email with the recording link to you in a couple of days. So without further delay, I'd like to introduce Medill's Associate Dean of Journalism, Beth Bennett. Hi everyone, thanks so much for joining us today. I am so happy to see everyone's faces and see you out there. Um, and I'm also happy about your interest in journalism. Um, journalism is a really important, fundamental and foundational service in this world right now. And I'm so happy when I see students in high school who are interested in learning more about journalism and in doing their own important journalism. Um, some of you I know are looking at Northwestern and looking at Medill as a potential option um, for college. And if you are, we are very happy to engage with you, to talk with you about our programs and our offerings. You can visit our website for more information about how to get in touch. But also every week we run a Medill information session and in the chat, Stacy has posted a link to um, a, or in a link to our website where you can find more information about how to, how to participate in one of these info sessions. And um, keep in mind that our early decision deadline is coming up, it's November 1. And again, we're always happy to talk about our programming. And so without further ado, I would like to introduce my colleague, J.A. Adande, sports journalist and director of Medill's sports journalism program and professor extraordinaire. Um, so, J.A., I will turn it over to you. Thank you very much. Associate Dean, Dr. Bennett, um, we're still getting used to addressing her by her title. And she just received her doctorate this year. Um, so continuing to learn, it's a, probably a good example for all of us, continuing to learn even as uh, she has a multitude of duties here, um, helping to, to uh, educate the next generation of journalists. And it, it is exciting to see so many young people interested in this field. Uh, it's great to see all of you, everybody. So I'll do a big wave. <laughs> Let's all say thanks to Stacy Simpson and Sarah Brazil, who do such a great job. Unfortunately, you're not able to see the benefits of their full talents. Uh, they, they put together our events. Normally, we'd all be gathered in person, um, but they have done an excellent job, as so many other of our colleagues have, in, in adjusting and adapting to this new situation. So she's now uh, in charge of hosting our digital gatherings where uh, uh, you don't get to see the food. Uh, it's just, you still will get to experience uh, the Millville merchandise that she oversees as well. So the lucky winner um, will get to partake in that. Uh, usually they have some items for sale in the lobby. Um, so I'm just gonna pretend in my mind that we're all in the uh, forum of our, our beautiful uh, McCormick Foundation building and uh, we'll proceed. So instead, uh, we'll do this via sharing screen and I'll start off um, with this. If everyone can see this, um, I'd like to say it represents uh, the limitless horizons, but uh, uh, it really just was this cool thing that I was able to see. I, I just found it on PowerPoint. So I thought it was a cool way to start off. Um, as we talk about what I want to hopefully inspire you to do is to seek out ways that you can learn, borrow, pay homage to, um, more technically steal. Um, but everyone got to where he or she is in this business by uh, taking from and adapting and building upon what has come in the past. And that's something that we see throughout our pop culture. 
I'm going to show you this image. Um, this is from uh, the Star Wars reboot, um, The Force Awakens, which came out eight years ago or so. Um, but it's funny because it actually harkens back to the days of the original Star Wars movie that came out in 1977. And two years after that, as you see this image of, of the TIE fighter set against the sunset, and me, because I'm old and I'm somewhat of a movie buff, I re immediately recognized what they were trying to evoke. And what they were going for were these shots from Apocalypse Now, which was a movie set in Vietnam. Uh, it came out in 1979, two years after the original Star Wars came out. But you saw it featured a lot of imagery of helicopters, helicopters against the sunset. As I show you these images from Star Wars and then the, um, the movie poster from Apocalypse Now, you can really see uh, how evocative it is of, of Apocalypse Now. And the, the makers of Star Wars The Force Awakens um, were quite candid about the fact that, yes, they were going for that shot. They were famous shots, um, imagery that came out of Apocalypse Now when they were trying to evoke that. So even as you're doing a modern movie, um, some you know decades later that's set in a different part of the galaxy, uh, you can still call upon the image, imagery and the collective works uh, that our society has produced. And just, just do subtle callbacks. They didn't announce it, they didn't specifically state, but if you knew, you knew. And uh, for film buffs, this was just sort of an acknowledgement of some famous imagery. Um, sound as well. So who can name, if you wanna mute or top in the chat, who, who can name the person on the right in this photograph? Bruno Mars. Yes, Bruno Mars. Now here's where, um, here's where with some trepidation, I'm gonna ask if anyone can name the person on the left in this photograph. This is for the old fogies here. <laughs> Alicia, Alicia Amstel said sting right away. Yes, thank you. I feel um, validated. I don't feel so old after all. <laughs> uh, so yes, that's uh, Sting and Bruno Mars. And the reason I, I put them together, excuse me for one second as I, Go over here to Spotify. So I'm going to play you a Bruno Mars song, which you'll probably recognize. So as soon as I heard that, and Bruno Mars is someone that, um, you know, really doesn't try to hide the influences on his work and what he's trying to evoke. So as soon as people of my generation heard that song, we knew immediately where that was coming from. And I'll play this song by Sting and the police. And let's see if you can hear the <laughs> So you can see the, the similarities, you can hear the similarities there, and that's Bruno Mars paying homage to something that came in the past. And I'm going to go back to screen sharing, and there was this cool in case for those who couldn't, um, sorry, uh, to make things a little more obvious, someone did this really cool mashup of those two songs. slideshow version. All right, if I play this, you'll be able to hear the combination of these as soon as we get through this commercial. All right, here we go. So you'll see how well these two songs fit together when you hear this matchup. So 
that's a pretty cool way that they were able to adapt and update songs that came apart, came out decades apart, and they fit together pretty well. Um, if you play, find that on YouTube, it, it goes on. It, it, it just blends really well. So how does that fit into sports? What are some examples in sports that we can find? I mean, screen share mode. All right. Um, sorry, I'm on my old computer. This is really slow. So here's an example of a great writer that I wanted to borrow from. Um, something that had always stayed with me from the time it came out, late 80s, early 90s, when the story came out. So this is a Sports Illustrated story by Gary Smith, um, one of the great sports writers of, of his generation. And it was about Jim Valvano, who was a basketball coach, was famous, won the NCAA championship in 1983 at North Carolina State. And he was going through cancer. You might have seen his speech. They tend to play it every year at the ESPY Awards. Um, the famous line is, don't give up, don't ever give up. And um, this is while he was fighting cancer and uh, Gary Smith followed him around as, as he continued to try to live his life while he was dealing with this disease. And he described it as, he entered the arena with his wife on his arm and a container of holy water from Lourdes in his black leather bag. His back and hips and knees ached. That was the disease, they told him. His ears rang and his stomach turned and his hands and feet were dead. That, they said, was the cure. Each step he took brought a rattle from his bag. 24 tablets of Advil were usually enough to get him through the day. Just this difficulty of, of just going into the arena, just walking in, how much of a challenge it was for Jim Valvano as he was fighting cancer. Um, well, in 2003, I believe it was, I was uh, assigned a story about a referee who had been officiating 50 years. He worked from high schools, college, worked in the NFL, decided he wanted to leave the NFL and go back to high schools because he wanted to work with younger referees and work with kids. And um, he'd been diagnosed with cancer, hadn't been give, given very long to live. And so as a, as a treat, as a thank you, as a salute to him, some of his former colleagues from the NFL that used to work in the NFL with them all got together and they worked this high school game with him. Uh, they, they plotted it out. They, they didn't let him know until like right before the game. So they even assigned a fake crew for him to work with all week. And then right before the game, here come all these old NFL referees into the room with him, the locker room. And then they worked out, they went out and they called the game. It, it was kind of funny. They actually, these NFL refs had to, in order to work the game officially, they had to be certified by the Portland uh, this was in Portland, Oregon. They had to be certified by the Portland High School Sports Association. So all these NFL referees had to take the Portland High School referees test. But they did, and they all passed, and they came in. Um, but I, I went up there, and I, I walked in with him. And I, it just, to me, brought back memories of that same, of that story. So what I wrote was that it was looking like one of the bad days for Vern Marshall. The day before had been one of the good ones, when he felt well enough to take a long walk. Now his pancreatic cancer was taking the upper hand again, forcing him to stop on his way into Lincoln High and throw up. He kept going because he was about to do what he always did, referee a football game. That was his work for almost 50 years, including 13 in the NFL. It's the only thing I ever did, Marshall 67 said. This has been a lifelong deal for me. So just that same imagery, that notion of a man fighting through camp cancer just to show up to work, um, you know, hopefully you can see the parallels there. And um, so I tried to evoke this, this writing that had stayed with me. Um, and that's how you get ideas. People wonder, how am I going to cover this? What am I going to do about uh, writing? What if, if I get this assignment? What direction? How do I start? Where do I go? Well, many times the answer is there in the past. Um, you know, and, and you want to pay tribute. You want to acknowledge the, the great writing that you've seen, the, the, the great things that you've heard. So that was my way, um, both in trying to honor, I, I was trying to honor Vern Marshall, this very noble, brave, courageous, I would even say, 67 year old man who was dying. He died a few months after this and still was so committed to his job that um, he showed up to work and his colleagues felt so highly about him that uh, they flew into Portland and took the Portland High School Association refereeing test just so they could work this game as a tribute to him. Um, but look at what it, take just, it took just for him to get to the field, uh, just for him to do his job. He had to fight through this. Uh, so 
I was simultaneously paying homage to him and also paying homage to one of the writers that I read when I was growing up who made a big influence on me. Um, some other examples. So Scott Van Pelt, if you watch him on SportsCenter, here he is, listen to him. So naturally, doing these highlights. Some Tarleton Delta State. Sure. That's Zamari Manning. Where is he? We're late on the whoops, but forgive us. Here we so go. Scott Van Pelt Manning. likes to do those whoops. And that's, uh, I can't hit that octave that he did. Um, but that comes from, from Chris Berman, a long time, one of the founding voices of ESPN. And here's Chris Berman's version. The sound quality on this isn't as great, um, but here's how he does it. Not sure on that fences, all right? We got British audience to sell the football. Why don't we do this? Ultimate trickery. Golf. To what? That he falls, and he's gone. It's a cut. Awesome. Earl Gray. It's a 65-yard So that's where Scott Van Pelt gets the whoops from Chris Berman. And a lot of Chris Berman's style actually comes from Howard Cosell and also Red Barber, who was one of, um, who was, was one of uh, Chris Berman's influences. And so his home run call comes from Red Barber, as I'll play this. So this is one where he discusses um, two of his influences, actually, Red Barber and Howard Cosell. Thank you the Swami. Back, 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 actually is a call by one of the greatest announcers ever, Red Barber. 1947 World Series. Joe DiMaggio at the plate, Yankees. One out of here driving in. Let me try that tonight with a home run. kind of a tribute to Howard Cosell. Hello again, everyone. I'm Howard Cosell. I'm not trying to imitate him, but I, I thought it was so good and descriptive and exciting. Then we have fun with it, but it could go all the way. Everybody does. So he could go all the way isn't a direct quote, but it's evocative of something Howard Cosell. And I happen to find something here that comes really, really close to saying those exact words. Um, but it still shows you the cadence and the style of Cosell, which is what Chris Berman was trying to evoke. Wild game, the score 7-7. Jim's on looking for a receiver, but Gary Barbro picks it off in the end zone and watch him go. All the way downfield, the downfield blocking is there. It's a hundred two yards for a touchdown that ties an NFL record. So that made it 14 7 Kansas City. But as I said, a wild game, 10 turnovers, five by each team, midway in the second quarter. Kansas City leading 21 to 20. Jim's on right there to Sherman Smith. Touchdown. So, so the right there was another famous thing that Cosell would say. Um, so if you, if you follow the track, so Howard Cosell in the 1970s, the only highlights you saw were on Monday nights. You couldn't see anything on Sunday night. You couldn't see anything on, on YouTube or on, on Twitter right away. You would have to wait until Monday to see all the highlights from around the NFL. And Howard Cosell was the one who brought it to you. So Chris Berman, when ESPN was starting off and had the opportunity to do highlights on a daily or even a weekly basis, to him, highlights sounded like Howard Cosell. So he was trying to evoke the sound of really the originator of national highlights and Howard Cosell. So a lot of Chris Berman style is evocative of Howard Cosell. And Scott Van Pelt, when he got his, his midnight sports center show, he decided he was going to try to evoke the style of Chris Berman. And it came from Howard Cosell. So, so now you can see these influences that come around. And each person became known for it and for his own touch that he was able to, to apply to it. Uh, but now you can see the origins of it and the importance really, because if someone masters it, why wouldn't you want to try 
to approximate that? Why wouldn't you want to try to do something that evokes that style? So these are a few of the people um, whose style I try to approximate. Uh, the first, the gentleman sitting in the stands here is Jim Murray, uh, one of the all-time great sports columnists who wrote for the LA Times. I grew up in Los Angeles, the LA Times delivered to my doorstep every morning and I couldn't wait to read Jim Murray. Jim Murray's style was, uh, he had a, one, a lot, lot of one-liners and very witty metaphors and similes. Um, I'm gonna go in the lower right-hand corner now. Uh, it's Michael Wilbon in the purple. Uh, you can see a picture of him uh, from when he was at college in the, in the black and white there in the lower corner. Um, that's when they were here on campus a year or two years ago. He and Tony Kornheiser came here for the first basketball game of the season in the new league redesigned and reopened Welsh Ryan Arena. Um, but Mike Wilbon, what I tried to get from him is the way that he ends his stories. When he was writing two things, he wrote in a very conversational style. He wrote very similar to the way that he spoke. So that was something very admirable that I tried to approximate. And um, he also, he would end his stories in a very smooth way. It was like an airplane that comes in for a nice landing, a nice smooth landing. If somebody who flies a lot, you appreciate the smooth landing versus the rough and bouncy landings. Mike Wilbon always landed his column in a very smooth way, just a graceful exit to the column. And that was something I tried to keep in mind uh, as I wrote. Some people write great leads. Some people are known for their transitions. Mike Wilbon, one of the things he was known for as a writer was his smooth landings. Um, and Craig Kilborn, who you see on the left, the late Craig Kilborn, here he is talking to LeBron James in his very colorful outfits. Um, when I was doing sideline reporting, I knew he had already cornered the market on these loud jackets and crazy patterns. So I wasn't gonna try to do that. My own stylish thing that I tried to approximate was, you know what, I'm gonna wear a pair of Air Jordans rather than a pair of dress shoes. And um, you couldn't always see it on camera, but I at least knew. And a lot of times the players or the coaches that I was interviewing would comment on them. So the camera person would be forced to, to pan down and show my shoes. So that was my little stylistic thing, a way to be just a little bit different and also a way to pay tribute to Greg Sager, another Northwestern graduate. And finally, the gentleman on the right is Malcolm Gladwell. Uh, who was a great writer for the New York Times and has really become well-known recently for being in the podcast space. And um, his podcast style has a way of, he'll start off in one direction and he'll tell you something that you didn't know about maybe a person you didn't know about and then find a way to connect it to the larger story. It's not quite a misdirection, but he starts off with something that might seem really obscure and then is excellent at relating it to the larger stories. So I started doing a podcast this year. I'm right in the middle of working on it. Actually, my producer is, is texting me wondering where I am because we normally meet Wednesday afternoons. Um, but as I tried to write for podcasts, which I had never done before, and as I tried to tell these stories about Michael Jordan and the Chicago Bulls, I tried to approximate the style of Malcolm Gladwell and um, tell stories that were a little bit uh, hidden by history. You know, he's got the podcast called Revisionist History. So that was something that I wanted to do too, is that let's look at something that you might not know about the history of Michael Jordan and the Bulls, uh, hidden things. So for example, the episode when we talked about Dennis Rodman and Phil Jackson's relationship with Dennis Rodman, a lot of people didn't know that when the Bulls brought in Dennis Rodman, they also had to bring in a guy named Jack Haley, who was his teammate in San Antonio. Rodman became very close to him and after a while, the only way that you could communicate with Rodman, if the coaches wanted to get a message through to him, was you basically had to go through Jack Haley. So when the Bulls brought in Dennis Rodman, a future Hall of Fame level talent, they also brought in this guy named Jack Haley. Because if they were going to get the most out of Rodman, they understood they had to have Jack Haley around. Haley only played in one game that whole season, the last game of the regular season. He played seven minutes in that game. But he was very valuable to the team because he was their, their, their interface for Dennis Rodman. Um, and then I went from that to talking about Phil Jackson's relationship with Dennis Rodman, how after the first year, Phil and, De and Dennis Rodman had formed such a bond that they no longer needed Haley. But it wouldn't have worked in the first place without Jack Haley. That was a little bit of hidden history. And that was something that I got from Malcolm Gladwell. So those are ways in which I have relied on the people who came before me in order to find my path as a sports journalist. Um, just little different things that, to incorporate. Shoes, 
a writing style, a, a twist of words, maybe an approach to a podcast. So as you go forward, I urge you to, first you need to seek and identify people whose work is worth approximating or paying homage to, or yeah, even stealing. Um, you know, whose work stands out to you so much that there's someone that you would want to borrow from. So I will throw that out to you as, as we enter the, the question and answer portion and ask you, who are some of the people that you look up to? Whose work uh, stands out to you and why? And I'll ask Stacy to monitor that in the chat. Don't be shy, everybody. Jump in here. Someone, uh, Andrew Brooks said, Ian Eagle. Okay. So probably the best example of um, people learning from Ian Eagle would be Ian Eagle's son, who at a very young age is now the uh, radio voice of the Los Angeles Clippers. Ian Eagle, uh, you hear him, he does the Brooklyn Nets, he does NBA for TNT, he does um, NFL on CBS. Also, I believe college basketball on uh, CBS as well. Mitch Album, uh, that's actually someone that I grew up reading and writing uh, or trying to approximate. Mitch's ability was, um, he wrote very simply. So you would read him and you thought, you know, he doesn't use these fancy words. Mitch wrote for the Detroit Free Press. And he didn't use fancy words. Uh, he didn't use these very complex sentences and sentence structures. And so you'd read it and say, you know what? I could do that. But you also thought, I can't do it quite like him because he just had this way of connecting, of identifying what would resonate with people and um and really zeroing in on that and writing it in a very relatable way and he also wrote the book tuesdays with maury he he spent uh one day a week visiting with a former professor of his who was dying and he just extracted the life lessons um that his professor had to share with him and it became a very successful book that resonated with a lot of people um i see uh i see samantha ponder's name out here someone who was forged her way um, in, in the very male dominated field to stand out for the ESPN. Joe Buck, a classic, um, you know, understated, he just um, was going into the NFL Hall of Fame. Um, Kenny Smith, who is someone who's on TNT, a former player who I'd say his style is that he can identify what's going on in a game, show you why this team is winning, why this team is being successful, uh, but also pivot and discuss larger issues. I, I remember uh, I, I, was, I was really impressed by the way they handled the discussion. I, I like inside the NBA when they, when they sort of deal with, with larger issues that are going on in our society. And one thing about that show is they're unafraid to have those discussions. And he said something that was really poignant and it really resonated with me. And, and he was talking about a player who'd been known for getting into trouble and had his episodes repeatedly. And um, the player's mother had actually talked to Kenny Smith and said, why are you saying that about my son? And he made the point that when you do these things repeatedly, eventually that, that really is who you are. It's not just someone who happens to be doing things. No, if you, if you do it enough, that, that's who you are. And, and it means that you are okay with being represented that way. And that's something to consider as well as you, you know, being a journalist is a very public persona. You're, you're in a very public role and you have to take into account how you're going to be perceived, uh, what you're going to say and do and how that is going to reflect on you and your news organization and the people that you care about, uh, especially in this day and age. You know, if you're photographed doing something, um, you know, and it, and it goes viral, um, you might say, well, that's not really who I am. But if you're doing it, then guess what? It's who you are, right? If it really wasn't you, then you wouldn't be doing it in the first place. Uh, Jessica Mendoza, softball player at Stanford, uh, Olympian, 
and um, the first woman to be on a uh, major league baseball broadcast uh, who, and if you think about it, she can be a role model uh, much more so than many of the other people that you see because she didn't play major league baseball and yet people take her, uh, her perspective and her analysis of it very seriously. Why? Because she studies and um, she understands sports and she understands the, the basics of the game. Um, but unlike the managers and the, the former players that you normally see in that seat, um, she didn't actually play Major League Baseball. But much like Doris Burke, who didn't play in the NBA, we can take their words seriously because they are so well prepared, because they speak to so many of the people who are um, participants and they understand from them. They understand the game from having played it, if not at the at the highest level, and they can communicate that effectively and they're very perceptive. So uh, in, in some ways, much like I, I remember covering a um, uh, LPJ, the women's golf tournament, when I was an intern at the Washington Post and Tom Boswell, the columnist wrote that, you know, as you watch the women, they're playing the version of golf that you're gonna play. Um, you know, you can watch the US Open and you can watch uh, Bryson DeChambeau hit the ball 330 yards and that's all well and good, um, you're not going to go out and hit the ball 330 yards. Um, men don't want to admit it, but the way, we, the way most amateurs play golf, guess what? It's a lot more like the way women play golf than the way the men on the PGA Tour. So you should actually be watching the women. If you're a man and you're not capable of hitting 300-yard drives, you should be watching the way the women play golf because you play golf the way the women play golf. And so, uh, you know, that, that's perspective. So most of us, most men who are not gonna play in the NBA, which is 99.99% of us, guess what? We are going to analyze the game the way Doris Burke or Jessica Mendoza analyze the game. So you should be paying more attention as men or women. You should be paying more attention to the women than the men because they are more reflective of your path. If you would like to be broadcasting uh, and, and you hope to one day maybe be a color commentator on, on an NBA game, um, chances are your path is not going to involve playing in the NBA first. So how is Doris Burke able to be effective in that job even though she didn't play in the NBA? You might want to study that and, and learn from Doris Burke. Ernie Johnson's name I see here is very effective at, um, at being the, the traffic cop with those large personalities, not just physically large, but Shaq and Charles Barkley are very large personalities. How do you navigate that? And one of the ways Ernie Johnson does that, he disagrees with me on this, but I think he actually plays a character that is less cool than he is in real life. He is willing to, to be the butt of the jokes, to, um, to act like he isn't as cool as he is because it makes the show better. He's willing to sacrifice himself in order to let Charles Barkley or Shaq or Kenny be the cool guys, the cool kids in the room. And, you know, Ernie doesn't mind um, acting like a bit of a nerd because it makes the show better. And his ego is willing to do that for the sake of the show. And he's got a lot of Emmys on his uh, bookcase or his bookshelf because of that. So is it about him needing to be like the, feel like the coolest guy in the room? the coolest guy on the set or is it about him wanting the best show possible and trying to do the best job possible. He chose the latter route that made him more success successful. Stephen A. Smith, I've had a lot of people ask, okay, um, I want to be like Stephen A. Smith. My question to you is, do you know how Stephen A. Smith got to be Stephen A. Smith? Do you know how he got to basically host his show or, and, and or host his own radio show as well? And I can tell you because I was along with him for several steps of, of that process. So when I was covering, um, I was covering Georgetown basketball for the Washington Post and Stephen A. Smith was working at the Philadelphia Inquirer covering University of Temple basketball. And then I was covering the Washington Wizards. And then Stephen A. Smith got promoted and he was covering the Philadelphia 76ers. I covered Iverson at Georgetown. He covered Iverson when he was in Philadelphia. Um, then I went to LA and got a column. He got promoted to first NBA columnist. And then he was the columnist 
at the Philadelphia Inquirer. And then he started doing part-time. He would go out once or twice a month to do a show called The Best Damn Sports Show, which Fox Sports started up. That was based in Los Angeles. So he'd have to fly from Philadelphia all the way to LA a couple times a month. Um, and one of the points I want to make is you never know who's watching you. So while he was doing those shows, Mark Shapiro from ESPN saw Stephen A on those shows and said, you know what, he's really good on television. I should find a role for him at ESPN. And he did. And it wasn't, it wasn't, uh, you know, first take at first, it was NBA commentary, reporting, doing some sports center, and he built his way up. So the point of all that is that Stephen A. Smith took a long way to get that. And if you want to be Stephen A. Smith, if you want to be like him, if you want to make the type of money that he makes, you probably have to take all of those steps as well. You have to be willing to take all those steps. You have to be willing to fly cross country to do these shows. Um, you know, it's not convenient for you, but that was the path to being on television. So be aware of, you know, when you, when you study these people and how they got, and how uh, they do their jobs, you also need to learn how they got to where they are. Scott Van Pelt, casual, conversational, still really smart and good coverage. Uh, that's an excellent description of him. What I used to tell Scott when he had his radio show was that when his show was over, my head didn't hurt, uh, which is very different from most of what you hear on sports talk radio. Um, but he just has a way of talking, I would say, with you instead of to you. I think a lot of people, a lot of sports broadcasters are guilty of talking to you. And Scott Van Pelt makes it feel like he's talking with you, which is not an easy skill to master, but he is someone who certainly mastered it. Uh, what's my take on the Jason Whitlock, Katie Nolan situation? Um, you know, I, I would just say, and Jason is someone else that I've known for a long time, uh, when we talk about characters, I, you know, I, I talk about playing roles and playing characters. Um, you know, Jason has found a character that he is playing, a role that he was playing. Um, you know, I would just say, you know, we, we shouldn't feel the need to isolate and, um, you know, and focus on, uh, you know, the, the women in the business and act as if anything is unfair when, um, any woman would gra gladly trade paid places with any man in the business who doesn't have to deal with one tenth of the things that Katie Nolan has to put up with. Um, I would urge you to uh, to watch those video with Sarah Spain and Julie DeCaro, in which they had men read some of the the texts and messages and tweets that have been sent to these two women in this in the sports media space and. Um, really humiliating, misogynistic, um, insulting messages that are sent there. And as these men read them, they could barely even get through, you know, as they had to look the person in the eye who these messages were directed to, um, it was very difficult for them to even finish reading them. That, that's how difficult these were. But that the uh, video took off, it actually won an award. Um, and Sarah Spain made a point about it that was, uh, it was, it was kind of sad. And I, I said, why do you think this video connected? Why do you think it resonated so much? And she said, it's because we heard the men saying these things and hurting as they read these things. And we saw the effect that it had on men. And that made people take it seriously. We don't stop to consider the effect that it has on women. Like we, we tend to believe, at least in sports media, we tend to believe it when it's coming from men. We don't, we tend to discount it when it comes from women. And it took men saying and reacting to these awful things for, for people to take it seriously. Um, and, and it just shows how far we have to go. And, um, you know, in my classes, we've talked about, uh, you know, the, the challenges that women faced, A, just to have equal access to the locker room. 20, 30 years ago, women weren't even allowed to go into the locker room to, to ask the questions to these players as the men were. Um, they had to fight for that right. They still had to de deal with discrimination even after they won the right. Um, you see with all, all the sexism that they, they have to deal with. Um, but you see that they stick with it because for the same reason that the men want to do this job. It's fun. It's exciting. Um, it's thrilling to be 
to be there on the scene as these great moments are happening. It, it's um, satisfying and even necessary to be able to add your perspective. And uh, most importantly, they want to tell these stories, um, you know, and amplify uh, the great feats that these men and women in athletics are doing. And, you know, they have every right to and should be accorded every, uh, every opportunity to do so. And the final thing is as challenging as it remains, there's never been a better time to be a woman in this business. If you look around and you can turn on and see Maria Taylor hosting NBA Countdown and Rachel Nichols hosting The Jump and Doris Burke um, became the first woman to do um, a NBA conference finals. Um, we've had women, we had the first woman in two decades call an NFL game last year. Um, I wish it would have happened again this year, uh, but she did play by play. You can hear women almost every weekend doing college football play by play, which is something that you wouldn't have seen or heard um, in years past. So yes, um, you still see a lot, of, uh, a lot of garbage and a lot of unfair things to deal with. The flip side of that is there have never been more opportunities and uh, more great opportunities for women in this business. So you know, for the women out there that are thinking about whether or not this is the thing to do, now is the time to do it. There's never been a better, better time to do it. Jeff Passan, um, looking here, is a, is a great baseball writer, great baseball reporter. Um, uh, thoughts on Skip Bayless and his career? Um, one way to uh, one way to uh, think about it is that Skip Bayless is someone who kind of figured it out in that. So he decided he was going to be the anti-LeBron guy, and you know, rode that as long as he could. And then when LeBron, you know, basically said he's never going to win, he lacks the clutch gene, he's a choker, on and on and on. And then LeBron won the championship. And I noticed all over social media, all these people said, oh man, I can't wait to see what Skip's going to say now. What's he going to say now? Ha, LeBron won the championship. And I realized at that moment that Skip had won because as long as you're tuning in, even if you're tuning in to see him humiliated, you're tuning in and the ratings are high and he gets paid based on the ratings. So if you're watching and the ratings are up and you're watching specifically to see him humiliated, that doesn't matter to him. In fact, it helps him. All he cares about is that he's watching, is that you're watching him. So one thing to think about is, um, you know, how comfortable are you being uncomfortable? Um, you know, A, you want to make as many people comfortable as possible. Uh, the people you really need to focus on making comfortable are, are the people who are going to hire or fire you. Um, you don't necessarily have to make the audience comfortable, but then it's, are you comfortable making the audience uncomfortable? Uh, and if you are, then there is opportunities for you. But, uh, you know, what, what do you want to be known for? You know, so you saw you saw the um, if you look in the chat here, here are the the adjectives used for Scott Van Pelt casual and conversational, still really smart and good coverage um, that has worked for him. Right. He's not controversial. You know, he's, he's not uh, he's not out there fanning the flames. Um, casual, conversational, smart. Those are those are things that I'd like to be known for. And you can be rewarded for those as well. So keep that in mind that there's no one way to do it. And that the things that feel natural to you and the things that you aspire to be, the attributes the, to, to get back to the theme of this, the attributes that you want to incorporate and take from other people, chances are there's a place for that. There's a wide range of roles to fill across the 24 hours that ESPN is on. And so what's the one that best suits you? Whose attributes would you most like to, to incorporate into your style and into your persona? Uh, I saw someone mention um, Ken Rosenthal. Ken Rosenthal is another person who was low ego, who was a columnist, who was sort of on the path, you know, the Skip Bayless, Tony Kornheiser, and Michael Wilbon path, but he loved baseball. And so he decided to become a reporter to go back to reporting and reporting on baseball. That actually led to him being higher profile because he was able to become one of the best at that. And you see him all the time on Fox, you see him in the World Series, 
You see him on the baseball game of the week. And so he actually has a very high profile, not by espousing opinions, but by reporting, by becoming someone who is known for having the latest information on what's going on in baseball. Um, so people turn to him for information. People turn to Stephen A. Smith or Skip Bayless for their opinions. People turn to Ken Rosenthal for having the latest information. So there's different ways that you can go about doing it. And whether or not it's your opinion or whether or not it's your information, it's important to remember that people aren't there for you. They're there for the information or the opinions you have about the people that you really care about. So no one really cares about Skip Bayless. They care about what he has to say about LeBron James. No one really cares about Ken Rosenthal. They care if he can tell them um, whether or not Mike Trout is going to be healthy enough to play tonight. So always keep in mind, it's never about us, even for the biggest names that are in this business. And Stephen A. Smith was quoted as saying this in an in article, a profile in The New Yorker, that he's the conduit, that he, he always remembers that they care about the Yankees or the Cowboys or the Knicks. Um, and if you're lucky, they'll care about what you have to say about them, but they still don't care about you. They care about what you have to say about the teams and the players that they're most interested in. So always remember that. It's not about you. It's about these players and these teams that millions of people care about. Any others in here? Stacy, is anything in here that I missed? More, any more questions for JA? Now's your chance. What skills should high school journalists work on the most to prepare for college and professional journalism? Um, accuracy in reporting, uh, and really I'd say practicing, just, just, just getting your reps, um, you know, writing and developing your voice. And you shouldn't be worried about finding or, or about having your voice. Um, but now at, at a young age is a, is a time to develop and to work on it, to try, to experiment. Um, the great thing is that in high school and college, the consequences um, aren't that, that great. You know, the, the, the cost of failure isn't that high. I constantly tell people, and it's something I didn't realize until I got back to Northwestern as a professor just a few years ago, um, college is a time to fail because I thought back on a lot of my experiences in college and I thought back on a lot of my failures and um, it's okay to fail in college. The, the consequences aren't that great. You're, you're not going to get fired from your job. Uh, you're not going to have to worry about you know, paying your bills the next month. So it's a time to experiment and a time to fail. So I would say now what you can do now is fail because you want to do it now. You don't want to do it when you're at a much larger platform and the consequences are greater. So it's a time to fail. Um, and you fail by, by trying and you fail by being unafraid to fail. Um, what's some advice you have if sports don't take place in high school right now? There, there's, um, there, there, there's a ton of stories still going on, even for teams that haven't played. And I would urge you to read Shannon Ryan of the Chicago Tribune who did an outstanding job while sports were at a standstill of finding great stories. So, um, you know, the stories you can find and tell if there are no games, you know, the big question everybody has is when are the games going to be played? So really reporting and staying on top of, you know, the, the school boards and um, the school districts and what they have to say and, and pestering them even to, to learn what the development is. As we've seen, this is a constantly changing story. The Big Ten said that they weren't going to play fall sports this year. And then three weeks later, yeah, there was a lot of pressure and pushback, but also there was changes in the, in the ability to test and what the, the scientists and, and doctors were saying. So now they are going to have a schedule. And, and they are. so there were stories without playing a game. Think of how many headlines the Big Ten has generated without a single game or practice, right? So there's still plenty of news. There's still plenty of stories. What are, um, what are the athletes doing to stay in shape? So one of our graduate students uh, this spring just – studied and kind of searched all around the country. What are the Olympic athletes doing once the Olympics were postponed to 2021? And uh, she found one who constructed her own high jump pit. She had to, to get all the materials from the hardware store and she had to build a high jump pit to practice the high jump. Um, all kinds of great stories. So she did this story for a project for, for school and she wound up getting it on, on NBC Sports because NBC Sports focuses on the Olympics. And so she was able to reformulate her story. 
So she told the story, you know, there hasn't been a single Olympic event or even a, a Olympic trial. And yet she wrote a story about Olympic athletes because what they're doing in the absence of the Olympics, um, you know, and there's also the emotional things to deal with. You've trained for four years for this moment. And now that moment got postponed for a year. Don't you want to know the effect that that has on someone who has dedicated their life to something that they weren't able to do? You know, I'm interested in hearing what it's like for those people who had their hearts broken. Um, it's just like someone who had a wedding plan and they had to cancel the wedding plans this year. Um, so there are all kinds of stories to be told, even if there's no sports. So you could argue there's more stories. Shannon Ryan says that she actually likes it because she doesn't have to go to practice in games. She can write about specifically what she wants to write about. If you go to practice and uh, the quarterback sprained his ankle and isn't going to play, you have to write about that. Um, if there's no practice, if there's no sprained ankles, guess what? You can write about whatever you want. So this has been a liberating time for a lot of people. Um, what makes the story column most captivating to me, um, A, the way it is written, um, you know, it's two things. It's the story. You're, first of all, a, a story is only as good as a subject matter. Um, but how do you tell that story? Um, do you have a, a intriguing lead paragraph that entices me to read on? Do you have smooth transitions that get me to the end of the story before I even realize it? You know, before, next thing I know, the story is done. Um, do you have a unique perspective? If you're a columnist, um, are you, are you giving, providing me a perspective that I hadn't thought about before? Are you making me rethink or reconsider, uh, what I thought, what I understood to just be the standard approach. Uh, can you do any of those things? That's what's going to get me to, uh, to be interested in the story that you have to tell. Um, what's some of the best athletes you have met? I'd say pretty much all the greatest athletes you think of, I've been fortunate enough to meet. I don't think there's anyone on my wish list. Um, <laughs> I think I met Megan Rapino actually. When I, because I, I actually did a panel with her girlfriend Sue Bird, but I really want to meet Megan Rapino. Um, I'm just fascinated by her and how outspoken she is. Um, I haven't met her. That's like the one that's on my list. That I haven't. Um, all right, Stacey is asking us to wrap up, so she's got a prize to award. I do. Um, I do. Thank you all for your. Jay, I want to thank you so much for today. Um, it was awesome. I learned a lot, and I'm not a, a huge sports person, but there were some names there that I recognize. So I'm going to share my screen just to, to show you all this fabulous insulated coffee mug, tea mug, whatever. This is going to be awarded to, hopefully he's still on the call, Alex Burstein. Are you still with us, Alex? Oh, there he is. Yes. All right. Yeah. Way to go, Alex. I'll be sending this mug to you. Uh, you guys all registered with your addresses, so I'll be sending that on to you. And there's more gifts to follow. If you sign up for the other workshops, we have a really fun array of great Brandon Medill materials. Also, I did put in the chat, some people were asking questions about Medill and applying to Medill. I re-entered the link to our website, but if you just go to medill.northwestern.edu, you'll find all sorts of great information about our school. And there are links to our future uh, high school programs there. So if you can't find the original email you may have gotten from us, please just go to the website and you'll find it there. And we hope to see you again in the future and thank you all for being here today. So have a terrific afternoon. And thanks again, JA. Thank you, thanks for having me. Thank you all for your questions and for showing up. Thank you, guys. Thank you.